Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone in the room. Welcome everyone at home. Uh, this is the Bangor School Committee regular meeting. It is 7.07. .07. We apologize. We are running late tonight. We had an executive session that just ended. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started right now. If you would please rise for the pledge. The flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And next we have recognitions. We have Maine's 2022 State History Teacher of the Year. Superintendent Tager. Yes, and that, that is Jeff Weingard, and he is not here tonight, so I would like to hold that till our next meeting so we could recognize him in person. Perfect, thank you. Do we have any adjust, adjustments to the agenda? No adjustments. Okay. Next, we have public comments, and as a reminder, members of the public may address the school committee for up to three minutes on school and education matters. Complaints or allegations concerning specific employees or students will not be allowed, but will be addressed through established policies and procedures. Public comments shall be directed to the school committee and be brief and not repetitive. The school committee's practice is not to respond or debate with speakers during the public comment period. The superintendent or his staff will follow up comments outside of the meeting as appropriate. Before starting, always please state your name and place of residence. And do we have any public comments tonight? Nothing on Zoom? Okay. Next, we have superintendent's proposals and updates. We have no action items, but we have several informational items. The first is a data review update. Assistant Superintendent Kathy Harris-Smedberg will report on the NWEA data from the school year 2021-22. There he is. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, you may have heard that we do. S oh, am I? No, no, you're oh, okay. <laughs> you're looking at me like, oh. <laughs> um, we have um, a different assessment. It's called the NWA Northwest Educational Assessment. And last year we uh, assessed in the fall and in the winter, uh, spring. And we assessed in reading, language usage, and math. For state purposes, really only the reading and the math scores are the ones that we are most um, concerned about. And this coming year, we will only be assessing in those two subject areas. Um, I do have a brief summary of what's going on, but I did want to give you a little bit of background information about maybe why the scores might look a little bit different than what you're expecting. Um, NWE sets benchmarks for um, based upon the 2019-21. Um, and they are not updated within those three years because of COVID and so their numbers have varied and they're looking, they're trying to make things more stable. So using those three years, they didn't factor those into what their scores would normally have been. And we do know that students that attended in person scored much better than students that were remote. Um, and that I want to make sure that this is right. The person who attended um, during this loss, or the students who attended in-person school during this time lost about 20% of a typical school year, 20%. And this is based on Harvard Center for Educational Research, which is kind of concerning. Um, and this is due to inconsistencies in the time that they had in their instruction, they're in and out of school, um, difficulty learning during the pandemic, whether it's anxiety, depression, um, not having resources available, a variety of things. And then families just dealing with disruption and loss. What this makes more concerning is that students who accessed remote, remote learning lost up to 50%. It's like losing a full half year of education. Um, and again, this also comes from Harvard Center for Educational Policy Research. So we know that remote learning was not good for students overall. Of course, there'll be certain uh, people who are outliers that will defy those scores, but generally it was not. And 
in addition to that, students that were impacted the most were students that uh, are high socio, uh, students that are low socioeconomics, um, some of our minority students. Um, this is nationally. Um, and this is because lots of poverty, you have lack of consistent internet, um, you might not have the resources at home that other families would have, you know, simple things like having have pencils and paper. That's not something that's readily available to all students. So knowing this, <laughs> um, when you're looking at these scores, keep that all in mind. Um, so NWE does not set proficiency levels. They're based upon a bell curve, and it's divided into five different sections, low, low average, average, high average, and high. So um, they don't say you are proficient. They say you fall within an average range. So average scores can change based upon the people that are taking the scores, or taking the assessments. Sorry, getting a little. So you do, should know the bell curve inflates the middle um, performers. 50% is the median, and that's just the exact middle of the road number. NWA taken is um, taken from between 3.6 and 5.5 million tests, depends upon the grade level. Uh, about uh, 500,000 to 700 different students in 24, about 24, 2,500 public schools in the United States. They have 30 years of data in which to back up their scoring. Um, and a particular score in grade X does not mean a particular in reading does not mean that same score correlates or transfers to a different score. So like you got a 250 in reading, it would not mean the same thing as a 250 in math. And if I'm going too fast or it's not clear, just ask. <laughs> um, you should know that New England states typically and historically have outscored the nation. Um, they outperform the national average and Maine historically outperforms the national average also. And Bangor outperforms the state. So we're outperformers all around, <laughs> historically. Um, so the percents that I'm going to share with you provide a number on how well an individual person performs. So if I say 50%, it's the number of people based on a score of 100 that fall within the range. Um, the percentile provides how well that store did to everybody else. So if you fall within the 50, 40, 40th percentile, then you scored better than 40% of the people. Makes sense. Um, and I'm going to report to you on the 45th, 41st percentile and above because that 41st percentile represents what begins the average score in NWEA. I'm gonna caution you that it's a kind of a dangerous or a little slippery slope to be basing it on 41st percentile. That's not a score where Bangor typically likes to fall, but because that's where NWEA puts their, their average range, then that's where I'm gonna start for you. The state is supposed to set benchmarks. They have not set the benchmarks yet based upon how Maine students have done. They're going to do that hopefully in the spring, but I, I'll wait and see. <laughs> Um, math and reading data are going to be reported by grade level, and we're going to report on grades three through eight and third year high school because those were the assessments occurred. Um, grade three, looking at our district wide, um, out of 221 students, 67% of them scored in the 41st percentile or above. So when I say that's going to be ha average, high average, and high. And this is how I'm going to report out to you. I have broken it up so that you can see what the spread is, like the percentage of students. We see that 22% um, of our third grade students actually scored in the low range, but 32% of them scored in the high range. I won't go through this with each one. I'll kind of go through it relatively quickly. But Fourth grade, 67% scored in that range in the 41st percentile or above. Fifth grade, 64%. And these are math scores, I'm sorry. 61% for grade six. 58% in grade seven. And Mr. Tager asked me, how come that one was so much lower than the rest? Actually, they've shown improvement since last year. They were in the 40s last year. <laughs> so, Grade eight, 70% of the students scored 40 in the 41st percentile or higher. We're going to move on to reading. Oh, I forgot third year high school and 72%. I'm kind of delay here. And this is a, a, just a bar graph so that you can see the bottom, the red demonstrates where the, 40, 40, the 41st percentile and above were. 
and the yellow shows that those are the students who did not score. They scored zero to 40%. Grade three reading, 67%. Grade four, 66%. Grade five, 68%. Grade six, 68%. Grade seven, 68%. Grade eight, 65%. And high school, 74%. And again, there's another one of those graphs, so you can kind of see that breakout, just a visual. Um, we are moving into our third year of the NWEA, so it will give us some more historical data so that we actually can do a better dive into our data. Um, and we can also track some cohorts of students, meaning that we can track um, like a fourth to fifth grade to a sixth grade, so we can see are they making that uh, anticipated growth that we would hope for. Maine is still working on establishing benchmarks. And again, I said they said they were going to do it at the end of this um, school year. I'm not sure because they're actually changing to a different form of NOWEA in the spring. <laughs> supposed to be very similar. Score is supposed to be close, but it's not exact. So I, 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 I'm just putting out here, this is my opinion that they might struggle with some benchmarks because it is a little bit of a different test. And, Know how data works here. Um, I would like to see more robust scores, although we you know we're looking at the 60th per, uh, percent. Those are not scores where I would hope that we would land and stay solid with. Um, and again, we're going to be moving forward to fall and spring comparisons, which can help with growth methods for our students. Um, these are my resources. And then, have any questions for me? Uh, remember I knew Luciano. You one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't be sorry. This is great. <laughs> I have it's a short list. Okay. Um, uh, what's the percentage of students who didn't take the test? I would have to get that for you. Okay. It's a very small number. Um, I have it by schools. You have to have at least a ninety-five percent um, participation rate. Okay. Um, most of our schools met it, not all of them did. Okay. Um, we had, so we have a very high participation rate. Okay. I just, I noticed that the class sizes were all very similar. <laughs> and I recall hearing that the graduation classes were typically a bit bigger. So I was surprised that the 11th grade class was the 11th grade. Uh, smaller, but... um, well, I, you know, there are fluctuations within enrollments. Yeah. That's pretty typical, but you will see the numbers are relatively close. Okay. Um, next question. Okay. So, uh, I'm glad you brought up that they're changing it again. It's, I know that at a state level, it has changed, I believe, five times in the last 11 years. What has changed? I didn't. The testing requirements at a state level? Well, we've always had to assess yes. reading and math. Um, I was curious if, if there had, um, if there was, so I went to the state website and I read through all the testing information because I, that's how I live my life. And um, I, wasn't sure I couldn't find and I wasn't sure if this was something that we even talked about but what is the objective for Maine State's education like what's their outcome objective well there are education? there are a number of reasons why we have one is federal requirements they well, do no no I, I have I get I'm sorry I should oh. let me reframe okay um I know why we have to do the, the standardized testing mm -hmm. I'm curious as to why and I don't expect you to know this. This is just my general question I'm asking. Why do we keep changing the testing requirements? Why are, what are we trying to get to that we're not getting to that we keep changing? Well, That's again, mostly, there are... <laughs> like, so, I didn't know if anybody knew. Since we're such a large district in the state, I wasn't sure if we had any affiliation with anyone at a state level who would have an idea of why we keep changing. We've had a variety of different tests. Um, some of them have been purchased through various companies. Then it moved to a system where we, most of the New England states, not all of them, band together and made or man, had a company manufacture a test that would be specific. And then um, they've moved to a variety of, I mean, I think one's money. Fair. Um, two, I think it's trying to find what best represents the state or what um, our legislatures feel are going to represent our state well. Okay. Um, to the last round of tests that we had, not the NWA, took a lot more time. Okay. There was a lot of pushback from teachers saying that it's taking up a lot of class time and is this really our best use of, I mean, 
over a week at a time. So. Yes, I, yeah. Um, so I think it's a variety of different reasons. Okay, I would imagine it's challenging for the for the teachers as well to constantly have to readjust. Well, because there's always a learning curve that's involved exactly. in it. And every so. every assessment requires something different from teachers. Exactly, which is why. Um, I, and then, and additionally, if you look on the background and the things, you know, what are the technology platforms that we have to work with and. Um, security needs and things like that. It, it seems challenging to find that benchmark. <laughs> seems that there are a lot of factors in place. There are. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see if I have anything, I'm sorry. No, I think that was it, thank you. Hey, Appreciate that it. wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> Member Sichters. Uh, thank you so much for all of this information. Um, so I'm wondering, and, I, and you may not be able to answer this, but uh, sort of two questions. One, how does this compare to previous years? And it sounds like that may be more difficult. And secondly, how does this compare to other school districts? Um, they are, um, it's hard to compare us to other school districts right now because they're not, re you'd have to go school by school. Um, so, you know, we can look at how other schools did in comparison to us, but I'd have to pull out individual schools. It's not like they're giving us a nice spreadsheet like they've done in the past sometimes to do that. Um, and they're doing that purposefully. Uh, they don't want us to do those comparisons. Um, the other thing, how does it compare in the past? Well, this is only, we've only done it two years. So we don't have really good comparative data. We have the first year out of COVID and then the second year out of COVID. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that what we'll be able to see is um, trending patterns up from those three years, uh, especially as we get back into a more, you know, normal type year. Um, I think if we looked at it really honestly, we would say these are not, I mean, we like to see things in the 80th percent. Um, we, we are a higher performing school. Um, it's a new test. It's, you know, a pandemic. It's, um, there's a lot of disruption in learning. I mean, sound like I'm making a lot of excuses, but uh, I think you'd find that nationally that you're saying that too, so. And if we wanted to find out what area school districts or even school districts that are similar size to ours, like Scarborough, for example, how would that. we find that? Um, there, there's a website. Um, no, it's not. Yes, there is. There is a data um, website um, main. I can find it for you and get it to you. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, I could certainly pull that information together and do a comparison. Because I know we were incredibly proud of Bangor schools in that we were able to go in person. And we strongly defended that action. And it would be really interesting to compare us to some of our, our neighboring districts that did not go did not remain in person. So I'm curious, but thank you so much. I can find the website. If that's something that you want me sure. to do, I can do a comparison with, that would we'll be just awesome. take some digging. And even these numbers, I mean, this is such a testament to the teachers and, and the quality of schools that we have and how, I mean, how amazing this is. So thank you. I remember Mundell. Yeah, thank you for putting together this data. Um, one observation, it seems that the high school data seems to be higher the the scores seem to be higher than the other grade levels do you, especially for reading do you have an idea of why that might be do you think it's a cohort effect because of the particular grade or if it's um because high schoolers maybe were less impacted by the pandemic in terms of their learning i would actually sense? really want to dig into the data a little bit more before i answer that i don't know if mr butler would want to weigh in on that or not or um... it's, it's a historically strong group um the the nuia is a classroom-based assessment it's the first time that we've ever had a classroom-based assessment so there's some familiarity with the environment that students could get i mean honestly uh, i was living back through the history of the switches in the assessment in the assessment, the regional assessment that super, assistant superintendent was speaking through the NECAP, um, it was such a strong match to our curriculum, even though there was hesitancy because it conflicted with uh, spring testing for juniors that prioritize around the SAT and the, uh, the um, AP exams. The match between the types of demands and nonfictional reading that was favored on the NECAP were right in our wheelhouse and our kids crushed it. 
I don't know the new EOS super well, I haven't dug into it, but my guess is like the trend is for uh, more recent assessments, there's more uh, heavy on nonfiction, lots of task, academic task oriented questions and familiarity of teachers who make it important, but it is a strong, historically a really strong cohort of kids. Thank you. Yes, um, member Carol uh, Sada, sorry. <laughs> Uh, this is more of like a comment or I find that the um, data about like losing math skills because of remote learning is like that's really startling to me and like I'm wondering what we can do to like support those students who might have not done as well um, like on the test because of how much learning they lost because I anticipate like in a few years if they take these tests again if they've already like lost so much math, how are they going to improve? Like there, there's probably a lot of answers to this question and I don't expect you to know all of them, but it's well, I certainly never know up. all the answers, but I do have a few. <laughs> um, ironically, our math scores were stronger than our, our reading scores this year, which is a little bit of a switch for us. Usually our reading scores are much stronger than our math. Math did have dips obviously um, and we do, recognize that there was additional help that needed at the elementary schools they were able to hire um, interventionists that were specific to math um, understanding that un having those foundational skills was very important um, and that was through our covid grant they were able to do that uh, i think also that you'll see that there is um, a strong pacing and understanding of the progression of learning and that's become we're swinging back and making sure that we're really on focus with that those are small things that well they're not really small things but they're they're tangible things that we're doing to help address those and then also we continue to offer things like title one which uh, provides supplemental help in reading and math um, and also teachers are doing a very good job in understanding that students may be coming in lower than what they had historically seen and knowing how to adapt and differentiate their instruction to meet those needs. You're welcome. Does that answer what you were hoping for? Okay. Member Surratt. Thanks for the report. Um, I noticed on one of the slides it mentioned that there was an option available to assess in January. Do we do, we do that or have we done that in the past? Well, interesting you should ask that. <laughs> we have not in the past. Uh, at the middle school, though, we are going to use it as our standard mid-year assessment in math because we felt that would be a good way to progress monitor that. Um, there are some groups of people that are going to use it as progress monitoring, but it is not reported out in any of the um, state data. Okay. So it's a fall, take it first in the fall and then Correct. January. Yep. Yes. Um, people like to use that mid-year one just as a progress monitoring mm -hmm. to see are they making the progress that they need to make to be successful towards the end of the year. Thanks. And who would do that progress report? Would it just be the administrators? No, the progress report is generated automatically when the student takes the assessment. Okay. Um, NUIA is actually good in it, how it reports out. Um, it will provide a report for your child that will say they, they scored this, then they should achieve at this level by the fall. And if you took that mid-year assessment, it would then mark whether they made the adequate progress to make that um, attainment for the fall, uh, spring assessment. Okay. Yeah. Um, and teachers have that knowledge available to them. So, so it would go to the teachers. Yeah. And, okay. And the administrators also have that. Okay. So you can have very, I know there are, I've seen teachers that will say, this is your, your score and this is what you're aiming for. And, you know, they get, they do the, a lot of um, goals, set, goal setting so that the students are, you know, trying to be invested in their work. And, and it's not that the score is the end all be all, but right. <laughs> right. just uh, something that you can search, uh, reach for. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That was okay. wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, and next we have the AP Achievement and Graduation Rates Update. Yes, thank you. Bangor High School Principal Paul Butler will give an update on the Advanced Placement Achievement results and the Class of 2022 graduation rates. Just a little heads up, this, the presentation I gave you has been augmented a little, it's roughly the same. Um, <laughs> probably could have done it. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah, so great. Uh, so a couple of reports that have never been stacked up in one, uh, one of, but it makes sense. They're all about four-year uh, programs and achievements. And for, as for the AP, it's as good as it's historically been. And for the graduation rate, it's historically good. And I'll give some context and uh, hopefully answer questions. So, uh, well, so just uh, by way of overview, advanced placement, just to give some context. All right, here we go. I hope it doesn't. Oh, a little bit, okay. Yeah, I thought I'd change that, but anyway. Uh, so context, AP's been uh, a big deal at Bangor High for a long time. And um, just as it, by, by national look, there are 35, I think 36 now, I've read about a, one that's uh, recently added to the slate. Uh, AP is a set of st nationally standardized curricula with um, trained teachers with endorsed syllabi that have multiple layers of review to ensure that they're nationally compliant to standards and that the quality that, uh, to be able to say that they calibrated nationally and to do the things the College Board does with performance, uh, you need those, uh, you need those fundamentals. Um, We've prioritized, just as an aside, I was thinking, uh, we made a priority uh, over the last four or five years to use appropriately federal money to have as many teachers, it's been my goal to have as many teachers as possible, AP endorsed, whether or not they currently teach uh, the course, because it's the knowledge of the highest standard that um, in a lot of ways uh, uh, drives us to get kids to that experience. Uh, they are administered to students regardless of grade, and that's really not perfectly worded. Um, uh, they're not broken down by grade level, except in one critical indicator that I'll talk about. Uh, a mix of students in various courses. The College Board advises against ninth graders uh, being administered or being enrolled and taking AP exams. Some schools do. We thought about it, but thought it was, we had enough in the curriculum to push students ahead as it is. Typically now, the entry to the AP experience at the high school is through AP US History. And uh, so exams, the uh, exams are over a two week period in May. As I'll share, there's been a long, a deep history of a lot of students, uh, breadth of involvement in AP. So that two week May window is a crunch. The schedule's roughly the same every year, but for students taking four or five or six APs, uh, they're challenged over those two weeks in May in all the right ways. And the score, the ultimate is the score of three or higher is uh, considered in the game for college credit. And I'll share some figures around those things. So. Uh, there are two factors that are important to think about with AP and the, is participation and performance. I'll start with uh, participation and what I've tried to do on the slides is uh, do some dashboarding that will drive some conversation about why the, color, the facts are colored the way they are. So uh, basically on the participation, uh, last year uh, we, outfit, we, we had 17 uh, AP courses, 30 total sections and 428 seats. Now there are students in multiple sections, so that's what I mean by enrollment spots or slots. Uh, 144 is historically low, but in the context of the challenges of the last couple of years, it's strong. So we had 144 students who sat for 276 AP exams. That's in yellow because that's a little lower than it is historically, and it's caused us to think about some factors as to why. Uh, typically, we're well over two exams per student, or 1.9. So that 144 taking 276, as I'll show a little bit later, is lower than we might have anticipated, but still strong. Uh, the red is the most critical participation factor. We shoot every year for nine out of 10 students. We've never had a requirement that students take an exam. Some schools do that. We've always said, make it important enough for them to want to show how much they know your material. We've fluctuated over the years between 80, some years lower, 83, some years flirting with 90, uh, but never quite getting there. I anticipated, I thought, well, maybe 70, uh, we had 64%. So basically two out of three students who sat in a course for an AP class sat for the uh, corresponding AP exam in May. Another factor in participation I'd like to mention is that we make a decision, discrete decision to compact courses. Uh, two of them are economics and physics. What you'll typically see a lot of places will do an AP full year course in economics, macro or micro, and then a full year in macro, and they take the corresponding exam in successive years, or in the same year if they take the two full courses, we compact them, semester of each, semester of each, both exams. 
And interesting, like one artifact that I think has been telling for a long time about that particular course, macro and micro, it's um, what we've thought of as a stretch AP, you know, uh, because there's a terrifically uh, uh, engaging teacher uh, who knows the students and the word of mouth is uh, sort of the Pied Piper effect. You'll love the class, stretch into it, it'll be great. And even though scores might reflect that it uh, might be a body of students who historically have stretched, it's always good to have those opportunities to stretch. And when you double down on it being a compacted course, I think that's a special artifact we'd like to try to return to. But uh, it's also done in physics. We take the highest level of physics, the algebra based, and like I said, most schools will push that over a couple of years and we crush it. So uh, that's a factor as well. Uh, this is not insignificant and just because it was seven years ago doesn't make it any less significant that Bangor School Department was a district, national district of honor roll for the AP and I'll give some context to that. Uh, that's the, the language, but the spirit is show us over three years that you open access to students underrepresented populations show increase over three years while performance doesn't decline and they take a three year snapshot and each year for 10 or 11 years now, this is about halfway through. So they had three years of gathering data and they, they uh, identified the district as one of 500 nationally who were doing both jobs. Challenge kids, give them opportunity and show that they perform if they're challenged. So that's not inconsistent. And that sort of bridges that gap between participation and performance. You want both. Uh, uh, so some pa uh, the unpacking the why, why, why two out of three, not nine out of 10. Um, the department heads are probably sick of me asking why, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not lack of effort, it's factors that I think you could probably infer that uh, will make sense when you consider them on the whole. Really four factors, I think. The block, the block schedule, not the Milan, it was the smart decision and for safety and prevention it was smart. My own personal opinion was that it was not good for achievement. Uh, when you have a semester schedule, courses begin in you know, September and end in February. I've got to wait till May to take the exam. What learning am I going to lose? How much confidence do I have in putting my, uh, putting my uh, uh, education on the line for this exam? So I call that the fall course uh, gap. And then the spring course crunch. I'm going to start this course in February. They're going to sit for the exam in May, and I can't miss a day. And so I know that was a factor, and I haven't quantified it, but that's what I'm uh, makes a, a whole lot of sense. And anecdotally, uh, I believe it's true. There's a perceived declining value of the AP as a credit-bearing practice, uh, as as valuable. And I'm here to tell you, and I say it every time I get to talk about AP. We need to do everything we can to erode that myth that there's not value at the end of the line. Yes, it's true, there is decre there's decreasing transactional value. Some of the more selective schools are not granting credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what we need to remember is it's uh, the two indicators of success, success in college, future performance is predicted by current levels of performance. The higher you are, performing in a standardized curriculum that's geared toward college transitions, the better off you're gonna be. So there's that value in and of itself. But there's other types of transactional value that are just as important, seeing it through my kids and the experiences of others. They go to schools where you don't get credit, but you're giving access to advanced courses. In the case of my own two kids, limited sample I know, but they were able, because they were able to get on the strength of APs, access to higher courses, they were able to double major. The other broad scenario, it's a student who goes to what was their school of choice, it doesn't work out, they transfer somewhere else, suddenly they've got a crop of AP credits that are now transactionally valuable. And it's true, definitely true, that schools are being more selective about what they grant credit for, but that doesn't mean they don't have value. So I think that's uh, something that we're fighting. The cost, about just under 100 bucks exam, and the fact that the AP now requires that you register and that you're billed in November for exams. Sticker shock. I argued against it. The College Board is the most profitable nonprofit in the entire planet, I guarantee you. And their shift to counting the widgets up front, I don't think it's gonna do like they think it's gonna do, marry kids to the exam because it's gone hand in hand with relaxed and more permissive opt-out policies, especially over the last couple of years. So students, as they were struggling with different learning situations, being at home, they're out of reach of teachers, counselors, 
in a lot of cases, parents who would be advising them into taking the chance, and they're given options, non-punitive, and options to, to opt out of the exam that we very, very often would advise against. So I think those are factors in the decreased uh, participation. But it's really about, in a lot of ways, about performance, and it's as good as it's, all, as it's ever been. Uh, so these are uh, uh, data points. So 83% of exams administered, that's the exam count, 83% scored at a three or higher. And uh, the mean score across the exams is three and a half. I wish I had the main data, and like the uh, assistant superintendent said, they don't make it easy to get this stuff. Uh, but they do release it at some point, and I'll tell you, the percent scoring at three or higher is usually 60%, sometimes uh, fluctuates between 55 and 60% in Maine. Mean score is typically two and a half to 2.75. So it would, doesn't take you long to see that this is outlier performance. And the thing about the AP program is we've expanded it. We're at a point now we add a course, what are you, what are you taking away from kids and to Robin for Peter to pay Paul? The bigger the program has gotten, it's defied the statistical trend of it getting weaker. The more kids, the more exams, the more courses, the better it gets. So this year, uh, evidenced in, among this group, there were 54 students, or almost 40%, who received some sort of broad honor on their, uh, for their performance on the AP. From AP Scholar, all the way down through AP Scholar, the distinction, that's how they're enumerated. So that's uh, really terrific performance and as good as it's ever been. Uh, Five-year view. It's important to look over five years. The College Board's really good at this. And it's uh, three data points. Uh, basically, the two, two tables say the same thing. The third says something uh, altogether different. Uh, so basically, you can see trending back. Similar metrics, data points, counting for how many exams, how many, uh, how many students, how many exams, how many scored three or higher. The COVID of the last two years. Uh, actually, 2020 was a year that uh, AP testing got permissive as well. And they messed around. They couldn't really, on the front end of exams, uh, do much, obviously, because nobody saw the world uh, being shifted the way it was. They shifted a lot of what there was going to be prioritized on the exams. Not to say that that performance isn't excellent, but I don't think it compares. It's not apples to apples over the years. But in any event, you see that there's been high levels of, now this, these, this 83% that you see on the two slides, that's a different 83%. That's not 83% of exams. That's 83% of students who earned a three or higher on any one exam. So uh, that's an important differentiation. And last, uh, in terms of performance, is the equity and excellence, which I love that the AP does this. And it's one that I've chased like crazy. And uh, we've moved the needle a little bit. It is the percentage of students who are over four years in a class at any one point earned a three on an AP exam. I said foolishly, before I saw how difficult it was to move, we'll get to 33%. One in three students will walk out of Bangor High. We've gotten as high as 27 or eight in my 10 or 12 years there. We're at 21, which doesn't shock me. Our goal was 25. I think you'll see that creep back up as participation and we get into a more normal routine. And that breaks it down by, by class in each, uh, uh, based on the last school year. So that's it in terms of um, AP performance. It's an excellent program. I argue every year I, when I can point and gather and point to the data I can. It's, I believe it's the most comprehensive and deepest AP program of any high school in Maine. Can't prove it, but I'll stand by it and let you argue me out of it. It's, uh, it's really special. Slide right into the cohort graduate. Now this is Good and as good as it has been historically, and now historically good with the cohort graduation. And again, uh, cohort, I've got to have context. And this has been one of the most troubling contexts to uh, rally people toward, and honestly, at some points, understand over the last 10 years. There's, uh, there's been excellent intent, there's been good law, there's been accountability that we're not afraid of, but lots of confusing machinations that date back to before 2010, but took residence in 2010. So those are the set of federal and state guidelines that. Uh, I'll just get them all up here so we can flow through. Uh, oh, back. Won't work. Ah, 
So uh, graduation rate became, the adjusted cohort graduation rate became a federally, federal accountability statistic around 2010. No Child Left Behind said outcomes are important. You need to pursue them. We're going to judge the quality of schools and the resources that go in them by how well outcomes uh, display. In uh, 2010, there was established a national uh, graduation formula. It's a simple one, but all the governors across all the states agreed that the graduation formula was going to be who is a member of your cohort, who are you responsible for, and four years after they enter a high school cohort, they'll graduate if they're on your rolls. And if they don't graduate, we're going we're gonna to tally all the kids that graduated, numerator, denominator will be all the kids that are in your cohort, that's your graduation rate. And I would not argue anything about that. If they're yours, you own them and you push them toward the end line that you want to get them to. But what does it account for our um, late move-ins, kids from really vulnerable situation? What it doesn't account for is really vulnerable learners who by their federal education rights have schooling till the age of 22. So you have students in the most with the most uh, challenged learning profiles, with the most comprehensive needs are factored into your four-year graduation rate when they'll be in your school until they're 22. So uh, I argue it falls on deaf ears, and then we just uh, pick up and move on. The most important thing to know about this is um, we're all in favor of accountability. That's what I think the school department is built on and that we need to continually pursue. I like this formula because it doesn't just say four years. It says, okay, you didn't graduate in four years. Did you graduate that group in five years? Did you graduate a group in six years? So that's what meant by the four, five, and six. My feeling is, Whatever your cohort graduation is, rate is at four years, it is what it is. You've done all you can, so you can do all you can. But by six years, it ought to be close to 90% as you can get it. And historically, look at ours, our six-year cohort graduation rate is hovering. It's never gotten to 90, but it's been hovering right around it uh, ever for the last five or six years, and we've gotten integrated with uh, interventions and supports. So schools must report through the state, through a database that they manage, with dubious rules and changing rules, you have to report out and hold accountable, and the superintendent has to certify your four-year, five-year, six-year graduate graduation rate every September 30th. It's a terrific accountability point. Nobody's hiding anymore. And states have rigid rules for how their databases need to be constructed and fed. And we've mastered that, in my opinion. There are um, so anyway, uh, what I thought I'd do is just show you what we look at when we look at a cohort. This is the database. It's the uh, recent database. You see Ms. Tager's signature on the bottom. I did a little dance in my office when he certified our graduation rate for the class of 2022 as a historic high 89.86%. Our goal we've been chasing forever is 90%. And to get it that close and miss it, it's a bummer. It rounds up, but to be at nearly 90%, it's a testament to a lot of things. But if you see a raid down, or what's okay, Bangor? So the uh, fifth year cohort graduation rate is the students that should have graduated in, in 2021, where are they this year? And the students that should have graduated in the sixth year are the students that should have graduated in 2020. How are they two years after that first, sometimes artificial finish line of high school? And that's the 89.72%. It's typically right around there. So you don't give up on kids. Oh, geez, you didn't make it in four years. Good luck. We get them back. Uh, that's what you see. You'll see over time some lower cohort graduation rates. We love them all. We educate them all. We believe that all will get there. But there are some students who are so compromised as learners that they're not going to. If there's a concentration of them in any one class, it's a lower figure. And I'll tell you the worst travesty of it all is when the state went away from their graduation uh, exit credential. Uh, and the last time they did the proficiency-based diploma, they uh, eliminated from the law any exit credential from a main high school other than the regular diploma. In our policy, we insisted on keeping a certificate of completion and a certificate of attendance. You won't see that in state law. So um, anyway, that's a little grandstanding. So the uh, story behind the numbers, I guess, uh, to lay it out, uh, the we're accountable to this and we're asked to be accountable to all the subgroups in all the divisions and then relative to Maine. We don't have the relative to Maine numbers, but I'm going to argue that our uh, rates among all these categories and broadly will well exceed uh, state averages. So you see those uh, dichotomy there, male or female, and the math adds up. It's uh, 
students who are ML or non-ML, or the students by various, uh, various identities or racial and ethnic identities that are part of federal reporting, they're all laid out and the numbers are historically high for us. And once the data comes out, it'll be interesting to see how we compare relative to the state. But it's remarkable uh, that the set of things and that Mr. Tager's urging and some more resources, uh, we're able to take a really good system that was, uh, was working well and bump it up to the next level. And I'll speak to that a little bit. So pathway to 90%, I had to write it. I had to write it as though it was drill round up for the header. So I think there are three major things uh, that I, I, I argue a tribute to it. I see it every day. Uh, so there's a school-wide ethic of care and interest in commitment to students. That was there. There were things added to it. I think there have always been layered planful interventions over four years and beyond as evidenced by that commitment to a six-year graduation rate of 90%. There's a balance of challenges, supports, and opportunities for students that we try to live out uh, every day and certainly as a group comes in and makes their way through the high school. The graduation coaching model, no question, it enhanced those things. It provided additional layers of support, care, and monitoring. You saw it with hugs on stage with a certain graduation coach. It's impossible to quantify how many regular diplomas were impacted, you couldn't quantify it because the work that the graduation coach does, it doesn't show up. You don't designate their diploma anything other than 1921 exit code, regular diploma, from, but there is some number, a higher one than you might know, that were influenced by the extra touch, care, attention, and push that a graduation coach gave. The current model of graduation coach with two that you approved uh, is only promises to double that. We have the graduation coach that's gonna work from seniors down and the one from freshmen up, meet in the middle, and our process right now is smooth, fluid, and focused. Uh, the main COVID interruption, I gotta point this out, Ms. Tager wanted to make me sure, make sure that I uh, established how significant it is that this year's class, 2023, is the last to whom the uh, option for a main COVID interruption diploma will apply. It's written into the law. Interesting, it's written into the law around graduation standards that don't even exist in the main law. But they've written a law, it's a good one, and it gave students a reasonable, op reasonable opportunity to earn an exit credential. We approached it differently. We didn't tell them about the option for the COVID diploma until you know, we really had to. We didn't want them to shoot for less. We wanted to see if they could get more. So uh, it gave them a reasonable opportunity. It encouraged them to re-engage you have a chance to earn the diploma as a special opportunity for you. And they stepped up. And there were 12 students, that's not insignificant. That's 3% on the graduation rate. And there were 12 students who were not even close to within reach of the high school the main diploma, but persisted to something that was a reasonable step amid all that's been challenging for them over the last two years. So I couldn't be more happy to report it and on behalf of the efforts. And it would give a, a, a big boatload of credit, Ms. Tager, for making it a priority and to aligning resources in a way that gave us a shot in the arm that let us get uh, on the doorstep of uh, something that's been elusive for us for a long time. That's all I got. That's uh, my resources. Thank you so, so much. That was wonderful. Um, super, uh, super excited. Member Spray, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Congrats on the success and thank you for the presentation. I have a couple technical questions. Uh, I don't quite understand the students who move in and out of the district, how they're accounted for. Like if you started as a freshman in Bangor and then your family moves to South Dakota. Yeah, so I didn't hit that much. Uh, so a, four, a cohort graduation rate, if a student enters your school and they have, wherever they started in the high school journey, if they come in in January of the senior year and they're in their fourth year of high school and they are officially registered in your school, they are yours to be account and you're accountable for their path to graduation or counting for them at the end of four years. If a student leaves, um, this is, I didn't hit on this too much. There's a difference between the graduation rate and a dropout percentage. They, they, are, they don't add up to 100. And that's hard for most people to understand because the popular notion of a dropout is a student that geez, just stopped coming to high school and didn't graduate. 
A dropout technically in Maine, and I think it's the, the definition across the country, is a student who said they were going somewhere else but didn't surface. I, I'm going, I'm moving to North Dakota. North Dakota is not a state that requests records. So we're not gonna have a records request to officially exit that student. If you move to North Dakota and I get you, and this is one of the frustrations of the rule, I get you to write me a letter or an email or something of substance where the state will say, oh yeah, we trust you. They really moved to North Dakota, look where the address is. Or I've done things like, hey, send me a postcard. I'll scan it, we'll put it in, you know? So it's a bit of a game. You never play games with kids but the system of accounting for kids and the changing rules that affect accounting and clerical work, they're a little frustrating, but you've got four years. No matter when they come into your cohort, day one or day one of year one or day 174 of year four, they're yours in your cohort. So I, I can completely understand how you get a student late in senior year or even junior year and you haven't had them all the way through mm -hmm. how that could be challenging another technical question what is the ses abbreviation uh, low income okay so it was qualified for free reduced lunch okay socioeconomic status. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah got it and then lastly I, I don't know if you have five or ten year data i'd be curious to see the trend or the year over year how it's been so, and we had a big celebration in high school and we had 83 percent you know we, we took this big jump to you know we put it up on the board and it's like wow you know, and Ms. Tager comes in 90 in first year, boom, we got it, yeah, so. I, I, I want to just kind of answer your question, Ben, and, and Paul, thank you for your presentation. You're, you're humble about this. Your approach with your whole team is what got this done. Um, I appreciate you mentioning me, but you did that at the school, so I appreciate what you did and your grad coach, and I want to just look around the room. Um, graduation rate is not high school issue it's a pre-k through 12 issue so everybody in this room is working on this we had two students in the entire district that were held back last year and that's a key too to get people to the finish line at the appropriate age but uh, paul i want to thank you and your team and one of the things that to answer your question ben when this work started paul re referenced 2010 it was 71 percent um it got, got up around 86 or 87 at some points, and I can give you the 10 year if you'd like it, I can send that to you, but 2021 was 82.44, and then 2022 was 89.86, and I also want to make sure that everybody is aware of the slide that um, Principal Butler shared, white students were 89.87, non-white were 89.74, and it tells you the number of students, we had 39 non-white students Black was 90.91, Hispanic was 90%, two or more races was 71.43, Asian was 100, and American Indian was 100. So the subgroups did well too, and to me that makes me prouder than anything else that you did. So thank you for what you did. And I, just to jump in here too, I think uh, Superintendent Tager is being pretty humble himself. This was his uh, really dream, if, if, I, if I will. <laughs> If I can say that, um, to, he really wanted to focus on graduation rate, and um, it's it's amazing to see this come to fruition. So congratulations to you and your team, and to Superintendent Tager. It's it's wonderful to be a, a school committee member and to witness all of this. Um, quick um, question regarding the graduation coordinator. I think that was yep. um, a success in itself and also the mentoring. Um, and I love how this all came together so beautifully. But, um, and especially during um, COVID and, and post COVID or whatever we wanna call it at the tail end of COVID. But what, do you, what can you say um, to community members who really invested in the mentoring program and how important it is for us to focus on not just academic excellence or you know, part of the academic excellence is to really reach out to students, especially students in marginalized communities or students in need to really give that compassion and that care to really elevate all students. I mean, everybody needs a hero. Some were new and some have been around for a long time. And it was, I think it was a call to action. The concept of mentoring was you know, everybody has a really strong instructional and academic gear and a classroom gear. And the invitation to, to engage a little bit differently, especially when a student is uh, struggling within the building, that was uh, a key factor. There are a number, we have a process that you've heard some reference to over the over meetings, um, the SST process, where 
uh, it very much comes down to the questions often start with who's who's the student's champion who's the one that gets them and if the answer is a little bit wobbly uh, who's the mentor hook them up with Julie hook them up with X number of teacher where success has been seen in the school. So that concept in and of itself invited people to a new level of interaction and uh, the, the influence of inviting others in to be part of the mix and be part of the hero, uh, uh, hero uh, brigade was, uh, was really a, a significant part of it. So I would agree that uh, the call to action, the call to be part of the extended uh, support system for students in Bangor is, is alive and effective. Other questions? Member Mundell? Yeah, first of all, congratulations. This is just really impressive on so many levels. And to both you and, and Mr. Tager, I'm very grateful for everything that you've done and your whole team. Um, a couple technical questions about the AP exams. Do we, is there any funding source for kids who can't afford to take the yeah, test? Yeah, there's a subsidy, um, uh, a reduced fee process that we, we access actively, advocate for students, help them get to it. It doesn't take care of all the exam fee. It reduces it by, reduces it just over $50 per an exam. And um, one of the things that uh, you, as a district that has a large AP program, uh, this is, it's not a dirty secret. It's pretty common practice that for your administration fee, it costs and of running a large AP program a portion of each exam administered comes back to you. When I get to the high school, that figure, because the schools are so resourced and we're efficient, there's about twelve or $15,000 in that fund that wasn't going back to, so we just made a decision and approval to use that to offset fees. And uh, we've lobbied uh, and been refused the uh, lobbying efforts to say, we, we don't, don't give us back the money, we don't need it take it off every student's exam. And actually, they said they couldn't do that until their, I was reading recently that their uh, subsidy, if a student from your school qualifies for the fee reduction, the school foregoes by rule, by default, the per exam fee. So it's just, you know, we do everything we can to get a, a student in front of an exam. I think it's too bad that sticker shock I know the idea, but it is it can be a deterrent. We're, we're doing everything we can to make sure kids get, get in front okay. of exams. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is about the, the COVID interruption diploma. Um, that, that was news to me. So just to clarify, so we had 12 students who got that in 2022? 12 in this class, yes. And so did that increase the graduation rate by 3% yep. according Correct. to your... Yep. Yep. Okay, so would we anticipate that next year, um, or actually, I guess in two years, because it still applies? It next applies year? to this graduating class only. The law expires on oh, September okay. 1, 2020. That's an interesting legislative question because they basically co opted a future decision of a, you know, by writing in the law, this amendment expires on September 1 of 2023. So it only, it only sorry, of uh, next, next school year. It only applies to students who graduate this year. Okay. So would we anticipate then that the graduation rate might go down, all other things For, being equal well, next no, year? Well, no, we're going to 100. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, if you don't have in your arsenal, I mean, basically this is, it's a good recognition by the Department of Ed that, it was time to think about an option, a reasonable option for a diploma for kids that were highly at risk and broadly at risk. It's the argument that they completely rejected when they revised the diploma all the years ago. So uh, I would say without that option, without uh, you know, a main COVID diploma that has some standards that are less than what a school would normally have, you're going to have kids that are going to have difficulty reaching it. This year it was 12. I would say this cohort, it's, I always get nervous when we look early in the year because you you're trying to scan ahead and you're worried about uh, where kids are as they enter school. So I try to wait until about mid-year before we get real about looking at things. But I don't want to look at it. I wouldn't want to look at a year that was impacted by COVID where we didn't have some extra tools in the, mm -hmm. in the back. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good question, but I, I, would, I would tell you that with the grad coach and now with two working backwards, because predominantly we worked with seniors the last year and now we're working from ninth up, 12th down, 
so, and I would also tell you that students that receive the Bangor High School diploma or the other, we recovered students because of the graduation coach and the efforts of the high school. So I would um, argue that we could stay where we're at or we could hit the real 90. <laughs> Another point one four or something, right? That'll be great. Thank you. Member Sorg. Yeah. Um, our special needs kids, do they get a certificate of completion or do they get a diploma? Well, the, the, that's the kind of the point I was making. It's a little bit of a blind spot. Some would say it's a, a uh, real wart on the diploma law that the most vulnerable students, the only diploma that they can uh, pursue is the one, the regular diploma of your school. Even though they meet the standards of their IEP? They, they can, so it's still our, our, um, <clears throat> our diploma policy is credits dispersed across content areas. And um, there is a proficiency endorsement. It's not a proficiency requirement. There's a proficiency endorse endorsement. So if a student meets goals and objectives of the IEP but doesn't meet credit disperser requirements, we issue a certificate of completion. If a student doesn't meet goals and objectives of the IEP and doesn't meet credit requirements, we issue a certificate of attendance. And there's a ceremonial exit for students. How does that impact our graduation rate? So, because uh, we got to carry those program kids. Program that you're familiar with, I'll just say a student in the uh, really vulnerable learner in the project transition program by Maine State Diploma Law and Standards is a non graduate. And they impact our graduation rate, if you want to put it in these terms, negatively. They're not in the numerator, but they're in the denominator. And the nature of their program will keep them by federal law in school and by need within their program for till the age of 22 but they're not working toward a diploma. They won't be a dropout, but they'll be a non-completer. Other questions? Yeah, member Luciano. How do students get into AB classes? By request. Okay. I wasn't sure if they were recommended we have, or if you we had have, to test in. Uh, my or... philosophy, our practicing philosophy is all shoots, uh, no shoots, all ladders. And I, it, we just believe in it. We've believed in it for a long time. Give them the chance, give them the opportunity. Do they like fill out a survey or they just? Well, they the course them? enroll. We have wonderfully okay. liberal course enrollment requests. And we advise, we ask teachers what recommendations are, but ultimately the parent wins. <laughs> you can try the course. Okay. Is it ever, uh, not all parents are very engaged. So is there ever a chance for a student who wants to participate but maybe doesn't have that kind of support are they aware that they can just ask to join the class yeah i'll tell you the culture is so good and it's i don't interface with students on this level but for the amount of students who reach into ap's and try them for the first time and succeed there are really good growth conversations happening in every quarter of the building around the lookout for kids to challenge them and support them toward achievement so thank you yeah. Um, to Sarah's point, is a push, is that the first? Um, yeah, yeah, AP class usually that sophomore they, year. Yeah. Oh, sophomore year. So, not, you said not ninth graders, not the freshman uh, year. There are some schools, uh, not many around here. They do uh, AP human geography in the freshman year. We thought about it, but it just doesn't make sense to us. Okay. It, we can challenge them plenty. And it really goes off model for AP, so why okay. push it? You know. And I think that's a great course to start with because it's. It's mm. fun, and they typically like it. A lot of the students do. So right. I'm just thinking something more along a push that will help entice students to take more AP classes. A AP Human Drug would be the one that a lot of places will offer. Okay. And some, a lot of the others are so sequential that they wouldn't be in the game unless they were super advanced, right? So. And I agree about like the lack of credit because my kids went through the same thing. We don't, you know, mm. it's too challenging for not getting the credit for it, but they ended up doing it anyways and hopefully they'll see in college that it really is beneficial in the long run. <laughs> uh, member of Sictors. Um, just a point of reference, I know the class of 21, those freshmen were allowed to take AP Human Geo and it no, wasn't very no. successful. One guard slipped one past the goalie. Yeah, it, it wasn't a I mean, very... We, we were toying around with it and that's... Yeah. yeah. That, I just don't... Yeah, it didn't oh, it work out. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's different. Welcome to high school. Here's a you know, test that's going to put you into college. And they freak. It's yeah. our geo course, geo civics, remains the most challenging course at Bangor High School. It, it is on paper easily. Yet 
kids graduate from Bangor High School with exceeding credit requirements more in history than any other discipline. So if you're kicking them in the rear end too hard, they must, you know, we're, we're obviously not because they're staying with the discipline and they're exceeding, they're staying with the teachers. So we're, we were wrong to mess with that, I think. Member Sada? I was wondering if, if, like, if College Board breaks down the AP classes that the school is taking, because I'd be interested in, you know, how interested are kids in certain classes? Are we taking more exams in like science or English or language or oh, things Oh, you mean like our that. course taking patterns? I never yeah. thought of it that way. It'd be interesting to know, like, are we outlier in the number of students who take X, Y, or Z courses? Yeah. Be interesting to know. Member Sarah. Down in my office, we'll dig into it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Member Sarah. I just, I want to just make sure I'm understanding a statistic correctly and, and potentially highlight it. Um, in the, the summary data, the four-year cohort, when it says SESY 134, SESN 142, does, does that translate to, to 134 students that graduated or 84.33% qualify as economically disadvantaged? Right. Yeah. I, to me, that is just, it, it's outstanding. I think it's what really sets Bangor apart from many school districts. Um, is our commitment to, to helping those economically disadvantaged students persist. And I think it's just a testament to your work, uh, Principal Butler, and, and all those involved in, in supporting kids in this system. So thank you. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Okay, moving on to report of reassignments for school year 2022-2023. I'm reporting the following teacher reassignments for school year 2022-2023. Julia Bishop from Title I teacher at Vine Street School to Title I teacher at Down East School. Angela Lee from Title I teacher at Point Six Down East School and Point Four Private Schools to Title I teacher at Down East School. Christy McClure from Title I teacher at Point Four Abraham Lincoln School and Point Six Down East School to Title I teacher at 0.57 Abraham Lincoln School and 0.43 private schools. Danielle Schneider from Title I teacher at Downey School to Title I teacher at Vine Street School. Thank you. Next we have a report of resignations. I'm reporting the following resignations for the school year 2022-2023. Judith McCallock, Chorus, James F. Dowdy School, Peekabo Mauer, B. Softball Coach, William S. Cohen School, Caitlin Dolloff, Varsity Girls Lacrosse Coach, Bangor High School. Thank you. We move on to business action items. We have action items. Um, and then first we have minutes for the regular meeting of August 17th, 2022. Recommending approval of the draft minutes of the August 17th, 2022 regular school committee meeting and the August 26th, 2022 special school committee meeting. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussions or questions? Yes, um, I would like to separate those because I was at one and not able to attend another. Okay, so let's do the first, the regular meeting of August 17th, 2022. And all in favor? Motion passes 6-0. And the next is the special meeting of August 26th, 2022. Do I need a separate motion? Okay, can I get a motion for that one? please? And then all in favor for that one? Motion passes 7-0, thank you. Six. Six zero. I missed yep. one. Okay, six. Sorry. Good. Six zero. Next, we move on to personnel. We have nominations of a teacher. I'm recommending the following teacher nominations for the 2022-2023 school year with a one-year probationary contract. Courtney Campbell, kindergarten teacher, Vine Street School. Catherine Walters, special education teacher, William S. Cohen School. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Motion passes 7-0, thank you. And next we have extra duty assignments. I'm recommending committee approval of the following extra duty assignments for the school year 2022-2023. Amy Alamo, .67 IEP coordinator, Vine Street School. Erica Hutchins, .67 IEP coordinator, Vine Street School. Suzanne Whitmore, .67 IEP coordinator, Vine Street School. Stuart Greener, 0.5 IEP coordinator, Bangor High School. Shannon Shook, 0.375 IEP coordinator, Abraham Lincoln School. 
Samuel Picard, 0.25 IEP coordinator, William S. Cohen School. Nicole Pinkham, 1.75 IEP coordinator, William S. Cohen School. Cynthia Howard, boys tennis coach, Bangor High School. Peekable Maurer, a softball coach, William S. Cohen School. And Bill Ames, National Honor Society advisor, Bangor High School. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any questions? A member Sorg. Yes, a question. I, I love these figures. What? Why do we do 0.67 and then 0.375? Can you explain that? Christy, would you like to try to explain that? <laughs> so you could actually divide that. Okay. Oh, okay. It's like. It's a okay. very good question. And member Sprague. I would just know that Bill Ames was the National Honor Society advisor when I was in National Honor Society at Bangor High School. <laughs> and there was chatter even back then that maybe he was going to retire soon. And I just had my 20th reunion from high school. So it's with each passing year further and further in the rearview mirror. And I'm very happy to see that he's still involved with NHS. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And can I, um, I guess we're voting, right? Yes. All in favor. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have donations, and I believe uh, Member Mundell will, sh will share those. To Downey School from the Charleston Church, backpacks having a total dollar value of $300. To Downey School from David and Eddie Lech, classroom snacks having a total dollar value of $300. To Downey School from GE Power Bangor, School supplies, shoes, snacks, having a total dollar value of $1,000. To Downey School from Penquist, backpacks having a total dollar value of $200. To Downey School from Owens and Minor, school supplies having a total dollar value of $300. To Fairmount School from Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate, school supplies having a total dollar value of $500. To Fairmount School from Maine Savings, campaign, for ending from ending hunger, a cash donation to support students having a total dollar value of $1,055. To Mary Snow School from the Charleston Church, backpacks having a total dollar value of $188. To William S. Cohen School from Bangor Federal Credit Union, a cash donation to support students having a total dollar value of $250 to William S. Cohen School from Bangor Federal Credit Union, a cash donation to support students. I think I just read that one. Having a total dollar value of 250. So maybe there were two of the same. So. Thank you. And can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No, all in favor? That's a seven zero, thank you. Next, we have second readings of a policy, and we have three different policies, and we'll take them separately. So the first is revised policy, GDB7, Support Staff Compensation Guide. I'm recommending second reading of a revised policy, revised policy, GDB7, Support Staff Compensation Guide. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? Motion passes 7-0. Next, we have revised policy GDB-8, Adult and Community Education Compensation Guide. I'm recommending second reading of revised policy, revised policy GDB-8, Adult and Community Education Compensation Guide. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor. Passes 7-0. And lastly, we have revised policy JICA, Student Dress. I'm recommending second reading of revised policy, revised policy JICA student dress. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? Motion passes 6-1, thank you. Next, we have introduction items. We have first reading of a policy. We have revised policy GDB-9, supplemental compensation guide. I'm recommending first reading of revised policy, revised policy GDB-9, Supplemental Compensation Guide. And uh, motion, please. So moved. Second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion passes 7-0, thank you. 
Next, we have committee updates. Do we have any comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, do we have any committee appointments? I think we will wait until the election and then the new chair will appoint um, the new assignments. Um, we don't have any representatives reports. Do you have a student committee member update, Carol, um, member Sada? Yes. Okay, so there's a lot I could talk about because school is definitely getting on a move, but um, I think the biggest thing at the high school is the adjustment to the new schedule. Um, so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have advisory, which sets off the timing of classes a little bit differently, which I have heard from a lot of students is difficult to get used to, but hopefully in a month or so, people will be adjusted. Um, advisory this year is taking a different approach. It's going to be slightly more structured so that it can address social emotional learning. And it's really trying to build a community around the students and their advisor and just have like something to go to twice a week and have like that comfort of being with people you know. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I can keep you updated on it. Also, sports season has started. Clubs are starting up. I haven't been keeping track of the sports that's going on, but I have heard good things from the field hockey team. They're doing quite well so far. Um, and tomorrow morning, there will be an activities fair for students to explore different clubs and see what kind of activities they might be interested in doing. And they can sign up to do different activities there. And hopefully we'll get a lot of turnout because I think students are really excited to start doing in-person things again and having things to keep them occupied outside of school. So that's really good. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have information items. We have several important dates. Wednesday, September 28th, 2022, we have a regular meeting, 7 p.m. Council Chambers. Thursday, October 13th, 2022, regular meeting, 7 p.m. Council Chambers. And Wednesday, October 26th, 2022, another regular meeting here, 7 p.m. in Council Chambers. And then lastly, any final questions or comments from the committee? Members Mundell. Yeah, I should have asked this when we were talking about um, the student dress policy. Um, I, I noticed that each individual school will develop their own guidelines for that. So I'm curious about how that's how that process is going to work and where the the guidelines for each school will be located so the students can have access to it. Mm -hmm. question and one that when it came up um, last meeting I did a bit more thinking and developing um, I think what we landed on was recognizing um, each school has its own feel its own culture its own energy um, to really work with each administrator most of whom are these lovely folks behind me um, to figure out what makes sense so I've reached out to um, all high school, both middle schools, and both four or five schools, um, and have been working with them for what the implementation process looks like. Um, I'm happy to report um, we've gone through three of our four class meetings at the high school, the fourth of which our seniors is tomorrow. Um, and I've trained all of our students on that. Um, we've drawn their attention to the student handbook um, and just answered a lot of questions. Um, on the middle school and the four or five level, everyone's done things a little differently, but I've just had very fruitful conversations to make sure it works for, for their school culture and climate. Yep. Well, um, will it, it'll be in the high school handbook? I believe it's, it, I want to defer that to Superintendent Tager, but I believe with the JICA dress code, it's, it's a district wide. Correct. Yep. Right, so the high school, so there aren't separate like written guidelines. No, I don't believe for so. Each school. One policy. One, so, okay, gotcha. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, member Sorg and then Member Sprague. Yes. Um, I was at the high school picking up my grandson, and I was quite appalled at the way some of our young girls are dressing and that this policy allows. And I'm greatly concerned when you see a midriff 
all of a sudden that's three inches higher than what you're suggesting. We see a girl in shorts so short, if she bent over, the world would be exposed. So I'm wondering, how are you going to enforce this policy? And how are you going to encourage our young women to be more appropriate? Boys, I realize the same problem with their pants and underwear showing. I mean, it's quite a problem. And I was just shocked. So even this afternoon, pants ripped all through and then spaghetti strap tops that exposed the midriff a good four inches. And your guideline was midriff is slightly showing is okay? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important question. I think the biggest answer to that question is within the final section of the policy, the implementation section. Um, for me, this policy is far more um, a process of communication than the the what of what the dress code pieces are. Um, the example you gave of a student bending over and seeing all of the things, that would very much um, qualify as a, an attire issue that would and should be dress coded within the policy. Um, the, the biggest differentiations, particularly around clothes traditionally worn by females that you're referencing, um, the language, and I recognize there's no perfect answer for this. There's always a, an issue of the gray in any possible answer. And I um, assure you, I went over um, over 60 dress codes, um, whether you go by a percentile or an all or none or something in between, um, there's no perfect answer. And I recognize that this is a policy area that can and will evolve in the future. Um, what we landed on in terms of um, the two issues you described is that the majority, but not the entirety of one's abdomen need to be covered and that the majority of one's undergarments, or if we're getting technical, where one's undergarments should be, um, shouldn't be revealed. Mm -hmm. The exception to that being spaghetti straps or bra straps. Um, I recognize this isn't a policy for everyone, and I grappled personally myself as a parent <laughs> um, what I would be comfortable with. And with that, it felt important to really take a step back and have a diverse representation of strong big feelings at the table to review it um where we landed is truly a patchwork of consensus building and um, members i understand that we may not um, fall in the exact same consensus with it but i i do feel like it is reflective of really diverse feedback and for today in 2022 it's it's where it's landing i hope and think that whether it's two years from now or five years or 15 years, this will continue to change to address whatever the timely cultural needs are of, of the Bangor community. Mm -hmm. What I'm concerned with sure. is um, maybe a lack of self-respect in some of our students about how they dress and the fact that there's no way that that current policy can be enforced. No way, because teachers don't have the time to do it and they're not going to. And I've taught at the high school for a long time. Sure. And very few will take the time to enforce that. So again, part of what felt important when developing this policy was to create that implementation section on the end. So it really defers to our building administrators for how students are dress coded. An example I can give from one of our middle schools, um, any questions about the dress codes go to the administrators. Um, so teachers are not, and I think that exactly answers the question of um, teachers don't want to be doing this and in developing this policy, this felt most important for me that students be at school and in class and not pulled out because of dress coding issues. Um, in terms of the question of self respect. That's a really challenging one. Um, the, the way I see our students dressing in not even going to the examples you were referencing, but the 90s feel back with a rage in our fashion choices. Um, I think that there's some conversations that are really important to have amongst the community members in this room. And there are some conversations that I think we could all agree parents should be having or guardians should be having with their own children. And it's a really fine line of not wanting to overstep into that, that guardianship parenting role, but wanting to provide enough guidance for our school community. And again, um, my sense is that if all of us in this room wrote a paragraph on where we feel like the policy should land, there would be as many different um, opinions as people in the room. So um, I don't know if that's answering what you're asking, but it, it's it's a compilation of a lot of conflicting needs. I see this as 
um, since we know the research points to the dress codes disproportionately affect specific populations. Um, frequently, when we talk about the dress codes, we're talking about female bodies. Um, it feels to me really important that we're equitably addressing student dress to make sure that they're in class. Does that work? Oh, Member Mundell. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the equity piece because I think that's what's really um, so important about this policy. Um, as a parent of a girl who was in middle school several years ago, um, she um, was at one point called to the, all the girls were called to the front of the room and asked to, asked to show if their shorts were going down below their, their, their fingers. And those who, who didn't make that cut got sent to the principal's office to get uh, like a, a, a sweatshirt or something to cover, to cover themselves. So we don't want to be pulling kids out of class for, for reasons like that. So yeah and, yeah, and I agree. And I would say to that, the subjectivity of it for those of you who shop in any places around Bangor, um, that it is darn hard to find shirts that are not that that upper belly length. And I think about if you put my sister and I in the shirts of our size in the exact same outfit, she won the genetic lottery in ways that I did not. So those clothes will look completely different on us and hit different inches or percentiles and that type of thing. So again, the, the point is for me, it's a balancing act of celebrating student self-expression, recognizing free speech is really important, um, recognizing cultural differences is important, recognizing what is empowering to some students might feel degrading to others, um, and respecting that balance of us wanting to create a really um, empowering, neutral academic environment where we can focus on those benchmarks that um, Principal Butler really um, brought home for us, it, it, there, there are lots, of, and also preparedness for the workforce. There's so many um, priorities, some of which may be competing and some don't have to be. So again, this was the best um, patchwork of lots of voices and um, I, I'm happy with where it landed and I expect it will change after years and all that good stuff. <laughs> Thank you so, yes. so much. I know you've been in the hot seat with it's this okay. no. for those who like it or hate it, but thank you. You've it's been a, a really good job. communication exercise. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you handle the very, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other? Uh, Member Sprague. Thank you. Uh, my comments are less interesting, but I just wanted to actually, you know what? I am going to say something on that. I, that. You did a very nice job presenting there. And if there are, if there's ways that male students or their parents are reacting to the way female students are dressing. It's a whole separate conversation for to have with those male students about how, why they need, why it needs to affect them or how they should react or how they should handle themselves too. So it doesn't have to be just focused on the females in the way they dress, but thank you for the presentation. I was going to say uh, that I think the school year is off to a great start. Our kids are doing wonderful, wonderfully, we feel, my wife and I, and I think our parents in the cohort and friends and caretakers for other students, it seems like everybody's very enthused about a more normal return to the school year. And hopefully it stays that way. I'm sure we'll have, things will come up, but everybody, I think the staff and administrators and everybody in our schools is working really hard to make it a nice normal school year and I think it's off to a great start. Thank you so much and I have two items as well. Um, first I wanted to share I'm sure many of you have seen on the news or um, have heard that we had a wonderful press conference on Monday and I really wanted to thank uh, Superintendent Tager and Dana and Ray uh, you know the four of us who are present um, Kathleen, I know you were present too, so it was wonderful. I would love to share a statement that I provided um, for the media, and it's this is um, something that is um, near and dear to my heart, the DEIB work that we did as a committee, and, it's, and the DEI uh, committee and subcommittees that we've had. We've worked really, really hard the past two years, and I think this is 
the beautiful product uh, and fruition of all of this wonderful work that we've done as as a big group. Um, so I um, I so I'll go ahead and read that really really quick and share it with you all. Um, hi, I'm Marwa Hassanen, chair of the Bangor School Committee, and I'm thrilled to be sharing this news with you today. It has been a work in progress for the past two years. The Bangor School Committee wanted to make DEIB, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, a central part of our mission to foster an inclusive learning environment. So we began implementing and incorporating many steps. One step was the creation of a DEI committee, which was composed of four subcommittees one of which was the equity audit. So when the equity audit subgroup proposed the MOU upon Dr. Mehta's suggestion, I reach out, reached out and met with Dean Bishop, who wholeheartedly supported the idea. But then we met with Superintendent Tager, Dana, and Dr. Mehta to discuss details and flesh it out. Once we had that in place, Jim and I brought it to our Superintendent Tager, sorry, and I brought it to our school committee during our retreat and we received full unanimous support from the from members and our colleagues. I believe that this research practice partnership will indeed strengthen DEIB efforts in our district and give teachers and staff a jumping off point. We don't expect them to lead on DEIB issues, so it was important for us to bring experts, including a member of Bangor School Department, who have valid DEI expertise regarding research, methodology, and facilitation. This partnership will consist of a collaborative equity audit that will provide quantitative and qualitative data analyses of disparities to inform our efforts and data-driven solutions within our district. It will also provide PD training to identify blind spots and fill knowledge gaps about barriers to inclusion and most importantly, we'll create a high trust culture with timely actionable steps for us to take as a school committee. This work is meant to promote equity and inclusion of all voices, and I emphasize all, to truly foster a safe, respectful, and welcoming environment in which students believe and feel that they are accepted, valued, seen, heard, empowered, and equipped to pursue successful futures. So I do this DEIB work for a living, so I know that students will benefit to see DEI a priority in their district. It validates their lived experiences and improves cultural awareness and critical thinking. And with lived experiences, I'm not just talking about race or religion or ethnicity, I'm talking about socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, and disability as well. Additionally, I believe it builds solidarity in the community and sends a powerful message of accountability, inclusivity, and credibility. On behalf of the school committee members and school department, we value strengths and diverse experiences and want to ensure equitable access and learning opportunities for every single student in our district. And lastly, I would like to thank Superintendent Tager, Dana, all the administrators and teachers um, who are on board and each of my fellow school committee members for their hard work and support on this. Something this beautiful could not have been made possible without each of you championing this work and I'm honored to be part of it with you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, do you want to say anything about oh, that? Or, we're good. good? Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, I just want to ask about um, any vaccine clinic updates. I know several parents have asked me about that. Sure. Currently don't have a vaccine clinic coordinated. When I spoke with Patty Hamilton, the conversation we had was last spring when we held the last booster vaccination clinic. It was not well attended. So um, we determined that doing one massly through the school, um, parents just aren't there right now, um, that they sh we can help them get a vaccine, we can send them in the right direction, either at the clinic at the high school or to the public health center or their own physician, but it was very limited in who attended. So at this time, we're not coordinating one for the school department. So we do have a plethora of <coughs> testing kits in all of our buildings. If parents would like to have some of those at their home, um, every school has a significant number of them that we can push out to parents too. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Any last comments, questions? Uh, Member Surratt. 
Yes, thanks. I, I was also very excited and happy to see the announcement of the, the MOU. And I want to add to your remarks with just a, a very brief, I promise, I know it's getting late, um, statement about, about my impressions of this exciting work ahead. First, I want to thank all members of the school committee for the many thoughtful discussions over the past year that have led us up to this week's formal recognition of a collaborative relationship with the UM College of Education that will focus on DEIB initiatives. Everyone took this work very seriously, and I'm very proud to, to play a small part in its success. Similar to the ability of, of a rising tide lifting all boats, I believe this collaborative relationship between the Bangor School Department and our good and trusted partner, the University of Maine, has the potential to lift up all students, my children included lift them up in terms of their academic performance, their social, emotional, mental well-being. I also think these efforts will increase opportunities for students to practice empathy, perspective taking, and develop a personal and action-oriented sense of justice. And, and these are all reasons to celebrate this MOU. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. OK, adjournment. Can I get a motion? Second. All in favor. Thank Passes you all. 7 -0.